Hello, Tim here, and in this video, I'm going to take you on a journey to one of the most fascinating places on earth, a cenote in Mexico. A cenote is, well, think of it like a natural sinkhole that forms when the limestone bedrock collapses and exposes the groundwater. You get these lovely clear pools. They're common in the on the Yucatan Peninsula, where they're popular with, of course, tourists and and particularly divers exploring the clear waters and the, under, the underwater uh, cave networks. And these cenotes, they can vary in shape and size. This one is the Bhutan cenote, which is just south of uh, Merida. Vary in shape and size, and they, they're connected to underground cave systems. But what makes them so special is the, the contrast between the dry, arid landscape above. As you approach these cenotes, you drive up to them, you're driving through very arid, dry landscape, then suddenly you hit this sort of lush tropical oasis and the water's clear and refreshing and the plants are vibrant and lush. It's just like stepping into, into another world, a real sort of hidden gem that's uh, just waiting to be explored. Anyway, from a, a watercolour painting point of view, I thought it makes a, a lovely scene. We've got some beautiful colours, lots of greens to explore. We've got contrast as well to, to exploit the, the darkness of the background caves, the little sort of the, the gaps between these different horizontal layers of the limestone rock. The verticals from a from a from a composition point of view, the, these verticals, these tree roots, these tree roots, they're almost like it's a bit like a cobweb, and they're coming down the the vertical uh, roots are coming down the, the the bedrock there, and they're hitting these ledges, and they're sort of then almost like a waterfall. They're they're coming out over the over that ledge and dripping on further down on the journey to try and try and get some water. We've got well, we've we've got a foreground with the shore, the the, the side of the the actual little pool here, and rocks, boulders, leaf litter. Nice palm tree to try and explore. We've got uh, different shades of green on that palm tree, a bit of light hitting the, the, the palm frond, some dead leaves that are almost got a nice sort of warm brown kind of hue to them. So different kinds of colours, hues to explore, the, the texture of the the texture of the actual palm trunk as well. These divers, I'm going to ignore these divers. I'm going to have a, a figure resting. You imagine a figure sat on this boulder watching over the scene. We've got some distant lily pads. I'm going to, from a, that's in the middle ground, from a sort of painting point of view, I think that's too much. That'd be too fussy detail. So I'm going to make that just quite a sort of light green in colour. And then these subtle reflections in the water as well. So I think it's a, a beautiful scene to exploit. I'm going to take you through the complete painting process from my initial drawing and then all the various sort of watercolour stages, processes we do, and then do a little bit of a self-critique at the end. So imagine that dappled sunlight, dramatic, clear, vibrant plant life. We're going to exploit warm and cool colours, play with wet and wet, and various different watercolour techniques. So let's get on with the initial drawing then. The paper I'm using is Saunders Waterford watercolour paper, a popular choice amongst us watercolour artists. It's really good, high quality, 100% cotton. It's strong, it's durable, it's absorbent, gives you a lot of time to to uh, muck about with your watercolour paint. It's a long, longer drying time, and it's it's got very strong archival quality as well. So if you if you're concerned about the longevity of your paper and making sure it uh, will look its best in years to come, then it's a good quality paper to consider. The, the weight is, it's 300 grams and 140 pounds, it's 15 by 11 inches. I'll go through the paints as I start painting in the, water, the, the painting stage. The drawing, I'm, I'm making a drawing with an HB pencil. So the first consideration was getting in the far waterline 
which decides the, the overall composition, getting that in first of all. And then these strong horizontals and verticals, getting in here the just, just an outline of the main shapes of the foreground vegetation and the boulders and, and so on, the, the rocks and so on that we've got on this foreground shore. There's my little figure I was discussing, sat on the boulder, looking into the clear waters, contemplating a lovely scene. Very simple figure. It's going to be silhouetted against the lighter, the lighter middle ground. A few boulders in that bottom left hand corner, exposed tree roots as well that we've got in the scene, lots of litter. You can see in the background I've got in those horizontal layers. I'm not drawing in the verticals of the tree roots. I'm going to be using some body colour, some thick, thicker white paint, gouache paint to denote those more than that later on. But I need to get that figure placed right. I think it's I think it's sort of all right there. A, a sort of representation of the major palm fronds as well, where they're going to appear. On the far side, these layers as well that we've got. Try and get those in there. They're sort of pretty key, a pretty sort of key design composition element. A bit of cross hatching where I know that that area is going to be quite dark. Then the actual water's edge, the lighter rocks just adjacent to that water's edge, a few key boulders there, strengthen up that far side of the pool. And that's pretty much it for the drawing stage. I start by laying down some clear water in that top left corner. That, that top left corner has to be the lightest part of the scene. That's where, that's, that, that's, that's the top ledge of the cenote where it opens out to the, the outside world and then into that clear water just dropped in some very light wash of color just picked off the bit of paint from my palette there and then gradually get a little bit darker so this is the sort of base color of the background limestone rocks the lighter bits of those limestone rocks and try and introduce different colors as I go down as well. So it's not all sort of fairly bland, monochrome uh, colors, so a bit of burnt sienna there. Oh, let me just go through my, the colors on my palette. The paints I'm using are from Mark Chapman in the UK, Chapman's Art Materials. A link in the description for you if you're interested, but really good quality and very affordable paints from Mark Chapman in the UK. And my palette is pretty much unchanged from previous videos. Neutral tint, starting from the top. Neutral tint, then burnt umber, burnt sienna, yellow ochre, spring green, which I will be using quite a bit of for the vegetation and getting those real bright yellowy greens, get those to kind of pop, almost like a, Almost like a fluorescent green. Then I got Ridging Green, Cobalt Green, Cerulean Blue, Cobalt Blue, Ultramarine Blue, then Arizon Crimson, Cadmium Red, English Oxide or Light Red, then two up from the bottom is Cadmium Orange and Cadmium Yellow. And then running across the bottom, I've got a few gouache colors. I've got a lavender. Uh, bottom right, I've got a, a light yellow gouache and then a white gouache. Believe it or not, that's a white gouache in the bottom right corner being sort of 
contaminated by previous paintings. The brush I'm using is a Tintoretto mop brush. And really, I really like these brushes. They're, they, they're very durable. They, as a quill brush, as a mop brush, it holds a lot of water as well. Get a good point. The point lasts quite a long time on these brushes. And this is their 1407 series, and it's a size six mop brush. So that's my top, back to the painting, that's my top half of the base wash done. Coming down to those light rocks there on the far side of the pool. Now for the water itself coming gradually down to the bottom of the paper and quite a key element to the scene, the composition, are those bright green lily pads on the far side. I'm not going to define them as individual lily pads, I'm just going to keep it as a an area, a small area of this bright green. So I've got that spring green there, use a bit of cadmium yellow just to really kind of emphasize that green. And then a gradual soft transition into the blue of the water, a, a bluey green, a light bluey green. This will of course dry a good bit lighter as well. So you've got to, with watercolor, you've got to try and compensate for that painting up to those light rocks on the far side. This right hand rock on the far side, that's a little bit darker because that's in the shade. So the light is sort of coming in from the top left corner. And then, so that would be the lightest, as I said, and then the darkest areas will be down in the, or down in the bottom corners, bottom left and bottom right, where you just don't get the light reaching those those areas. Water as it comes towards us is getting a little bit darker and we can, through the clear water, we can see a little bit of the, the bedrock, the darker bedrock. And that they're, again, they're gonna be, you're not gonna see any hard edges. So I've got to keep it nice and soft as I'm transitioning down the scene, going into these different colors, going quite a bit darker there. As I say, it will dry lighter. It might appear a little bit severe now, but as it, as it dries, you'll see it does go a lot lighter. I generally, with my color mixing, so I've got three main areas for color mixing, and that top area there are my darks. Then the middle area generally are my cools, and then the bottom mixing area is more for warms, warmer colors. Bottom, bottom left then, and the base color of the sort of soil here. And when I look at the source photo, I can see lots of colors going on. Cools, warms, blues, browns, reds. I'm gonna try and capture that with this sort of base wash as I'm going down. Bit of red there you see, some cools. Bring a bit of burnt sienna for that uh, bottom area. Up to the water's edge. And it doesn't matter if the water is bleeding into this area here. I can get a bit of a, a soft transition going on. Pick up some cadmium red, some cadmium orange and just liven things up a little bit, push the colors. But again, that will be a little bit more 
muted as it dries. I've allowed the paper to dry now, so it's 100% dry, and now using a half inch flat brush. I'm going to start in that top left corner and define the, the rocks a little bit more. But try and, again, try not to go too dark up there. I want this gradual transition from the, the top there into the, or down to these darker layers. Light, dark, light, dark, sort of a, a gradual transition down. So using the brush in different directions, again varying the colors that I've got on my brush as well. Predominantly cools up there. And with this flat brush, you can get in some nice, some nice brush marks, nice brush shapes. Quite good for doing rock, a rock face like this, where You've got some quite flat areas and then a little bit of a bump. The contour, the kind of, that kind of contour of that limestone rock. Bit of burnt sienna, bit of burnt umber in there as well. There is this, so this top layer comes down to like a sort of a, almost a platform, a plateau. And I'm just, with the brush, I'm just flicking up from the top of that layer. And now going quite darker on that right hand side. The first application is still damp and going in with thicker, darker color. So I'm going to get that soft edge transition between the two. Bit of a warmer layer now, next, next level down. A bit of cobalt blue. Angle the brush just to give a little bit of light to that bit that's jutting out. Next layer down then, which is going to be a bit darker because we we have a sort of, I think it was a cave on that far side. Didn't actually see anybody go in there, but I'm pretty sure it, it goes back uh, quite a few meters and it creates that lovely contrast, another layer of dark as we come down and a harder edge the that horizontal platform that i just did is going to contrast quite well with the the darkness that i'm going to be putting in now of that cave Neutral tint, burnt umber, bit of burnt sienna as well, a little bit of ultramarine blue. Neutral tint is a quick way of getting some instant darks, but ideally, I think you don't want to put it in neat unless you want that real dark, sort of a charcoal black color. Ideally, you're, you're mixing it with some other color and you get those subtle variations of, of darks. Little tiny, little tiny subtle bits of color in there. Just the bottom part of this cave, just adjust my light there to, to uh, remove the glare just the bottom part of this cave, it does then 
we've got then a, a softer transition to the boulders coming down to the water's let the water's edge. And so we've got the hard edge, we've got the hard edge of the top where the, that kind of orangey platform is, and then a softer transition down towards the, the bottom. So just test the the the, the softness, the colour of that these boulders coming down again just allowing the colors to blend so I get that soft transition change the brush direction to get a hard edge against the the very light boulders along the water's edge Normally with watercolour you go light to dark, but I'm doing a bit of dark here first and then I can go in with the, the lighter colour of the rock into that. And that, that there, what I've done there, is there's not much water. I mean, this brush doesn't actually hold a lot of water, so I've continually got to pick up more paint. But it does allow you to, that continual picking up process does allow you to pick up different colours Keep it, keep the variety going of the application. And then so that lighter wash, more water on the brush, down to that darker area I did. And you get that soft transition again. This lower area has a little bit of light hitting the boulder. I am simplifying the boulder shapes a little bit and not copying 100% what I see. I'm just going to try and, as I say, simplify them. And But I do want that ledge there on that right hand side because that's where, I was talking about those tree roots earlier and the cascading down almost like a waterfall they they hit that level that horizontal plane and they, they sort of cascade over that like a waterfall like a like a <laughs> like dripping cobwebs coming down which I think is quite quite attractive so that's going to be the that's going to be the platform for that down to the very light boulders down towards the bottom and getting that hard edge an, an area of contrast down there with the lighter boulders. While that darker cave area is still damp, you can see the little shine on the surface, the bit of glistening on the surface, it's still quite damp. That's the beauty about good quality paper like Saunders Waterford is that you've Giving yourself time, you know, timing is of the essence in watercolour. You're giving yourself plenty of time, depending on the humidity where you're at, of course. I know some of you out there, you might be in uh, very dry uh, conditions. So, you know, I know some of you have reported to me that you, you're you working in uh, areas of humidity where it's 10% or less, so very, very dry, and the, the paper's going to dry really quickly or those of you working in very humid conditions where it could be 80, 90%, then, then it can take uh, an age for the paper to dry. Me, I'm about, I reckon I'm about 50, 60% humidity. So it's enough time for me for the, the paper to dry. And I didn't pre-wet the paper. You can see going now for a good few minutes, it's still quite damp. And that was down to, I guess, using the mop brush first of all, and plenty of plenty of water on that on that mop brush, and that lays down that initial layer of dampness. It gives me plenty of time to work at it and develop these different areas of colour and edges and soft edges. As I'm Going through now, adding in 
just finer details of the character of the rock. I'm constantly looking at the source photo for inspiration. A lot of the brush marks I'm making is just like a sort of flicking. I'm flicking with the brush, starting from a, a hard edge and then just quickly dragging the brush over the surface. And with the slightly rough surface of the cold pressed paper I'm using, you do get also with this rock, you do get little bits of texture appearing, particularly when the, the paint is quite, the surface is quite dry and there's not too much water on the brush. You do get that sort of feeling of that rock, that rock surface. The flat brush I'm using, I should have said what, uh, make it is, it's a Raphael soft aqua, so it's a synthetic brush. I'm pretty much using all synthetic brushes at the moment, not, I uh, don't think I'm using any natural hair store. I've still got a, a squirrel mop brush, but I rarely use that. I, at the moment I'm tending to prefer the uh, Tintoretto brush, which has the same quality as the as a, a squirrel brush, same sort of softness of the of the hairs, the brush. But so this this flat brush, yes, it's a nice brush. It's um, it's half inch, say it's half inch soft aqua. I have tried lots of other flat brushes, but sometimes they're a little bit too thick. And then sometimes what happens with me is that you want that sort of solid layer of color that you want to apply but the brushes that the brush head sort of splits and you get a gap appearing and i find i find that happens more for me that happens more with the the other brands the uh, the other brushes that are a little bit thicker than the soft aqua so the soft aqua for me has just got just the right amount of thickness it's got the the half inch is a, is a good it's a good width for this sort of paper and the right sort of water holding uh, capacity that I, that I like as well so I'm just adding in some final touches to that background rock and it's gradually appearing more rock like hopefully looking a little bit like limestone as well. That cave area, is, that's quite, well, I've got the darkness there, but you can see the paint's laid on quite thick. So we're not, uh, I'm afraid this, this probably couldn't be defined as your traditional transparent watercolor technique. It's, it's quite a thick application of paint there. Down to the water side rocks and sorry, I'm hiding my, my brush marks here. I do apologize, but just using that flicking motion, that flat edge, trying to get a, a hard edge against the, the lighter rocks, there you go. Also getting a little bit of darkness on the immediate water's edge, just, just below those light boulders, just where it hits the water. There's a few, well, there's like a thin, a thin layer of darkness there. Hard edge against the water and then going a little bit lighter, softer edge into the, into the mass of the, the boulder. So that's that background pretty much done. And while that's drying, 
I'll get back to the bottom left corner. So I'd, I'd applied that initial wash, which was the base color of the soil here. And now going in a little bit darker with my back to my mop brush again, going a little bit darker to define the shapes of the boulders. Doing a bit of negative painting around those shapes. Down in this bottom left corner, there's a lot going on. There is the a big log, these boulders, leaf litter, roots of the trees. So I want to kind of simplify that whole area if I can. I drew them out in my initial drawing, but I'll just have a few boulders. So one on the left, then where I'm coming down to now, the a branch lying on the ground or maybe tree roots just exposed, perhaps with a bit of erosion or something like that. So some different object, different texture. And then as I'm coming down to this area here, just a few or a couple of boulders there. So there's a sort of triangle going on between the, the left-hand boulder that's exposed now, and then the boulder that the figure is sitting on, and then the, the two little boulders down on the, the bottom edge. So this, this bit here, I think that might be quite a nice sort of pattern of boulders and then almost connected with the branch the um the roots the exposed roots now where those exposed roots are i just went in with a little bit of darker color again this is diffused light down here it's there's a lot there's not many hard edges so it's gonna i need uh, some some soft edges soft transitions going with a little bit of Cobalt blue. I like, I like using the the cobalt blue from Mark Chapman. It's very vibrant. It's a, it's a lovely cobalt blue. It does granulate a little bit, which I like. Uh, so that's up to your personal preference and granulation. I think it's determined by the texture of the the paper as well. Oh, I just let that dry now, and so I now need to get in the tree. The top of the corner. Yeah, that cobalt blue. Is really nice and I do like adding it into areas of shadow, particularly if you imagine distant trees or a distant wood. I like adding in a bit of cobalt blue for the shadow of the tree. I think it's very effective. Anyway, the palm tree down that left hand side, fairly sort of abstract shape of haphazard. <laughs> that, is that a good word for it? Haphazard direction of the the fronds of the palm leaves and their, their petioles, the um the the stem of the the leaf going in different directions, but sort of all coming out of that crown of the of the trunk. And I've got to alter the different shades of green as well and have that so there we are there's a, a fan shape palm leaf start from the start from the middle and then go to the outside of the the palm leaf and if there's a number of palm leaves I've got to have them at sort of different angles to make them a bit more natural looking rather than too symmetrical and and sort of false connect these different really i'm just looking at shapes when i look at the source photo i'm looking at the different shapes of the either the 
the leaves group together or the shape of the sunlight, the sky that we can see beyond through the gap of those leaves, if you see what I mean. And also a few dry brush marks as well. That often helps with a with a tree like this, a palm leaf, just not too much paint on the on the brush, quite thick as well, not too much water, and then just quickly dragging it to the outside of the the outside of the leaf shape. That can be quite effective for these these palm these palm tree leaves. Not sure what what species it is. To me it looked like a a sable, a palm or a Washingtonia, something like that. Um, anyway, <laughs> if there's any palm tree uh, people out there, please let me know. Some say, I guess you, sometimes you can tell with the, the sheaths of the leaves that where I'm, where I'm now, the kind of shape of those where the leaf has sort of dropped off and you, you get the, the scar and the, the sort of the covering against the, the palm tree where the leaf once was. Gradually come down to the to the base. Got to connect it. Got to try and connect as best I can with the ground, and that's quite tricky because the ground is now dried. That surface of the paper is now dried, and I want to try and get in that sort of soft connection. So go about this with this flat brush. This is. This again is quite useful to get that sort of soft transition. Sorry again, you can't see what I'm doing there, but you get the idea. This, not too much paint on the brush, pick up some darts up there. Right, let's get some shadow behind that top left boulder, border, boulder, connected with the ground, bit of soft, brush marks there. Then the middle, what should I describe that? The left hand boulder in the middle, down towards the bottom left corner. Um, a few dry brush marks there, leaving the top exposed. That's where my hard edge is going to be. And then just create the form of the these branches a little bit more. I can be fairly expressive with my brush marks in the bottom left corner because that's not too much detail down there. So big, big dry brush marks down there. I will go in later with the the leaf litter. The little sort of little blobs of brighter paint for leaves that are catching a bit of light just to find these roots a bit more just branch a bit more and then the two boulders in the mid in the sort of middle Bridging green, a bit of spring green as well. There must be, it would be fairly humid down here, so it would encourage the growth, I guess, of algae and moss and ferns and so on. So I'd add a little bit of green to these boulders, wouldn't go amiss, just to give it more of a, an authentic feel. Add in some cools, just soften up some of those edges that I think might be a little bit too hard. And down to the middle again, create some edges, soften up edges. It's beginning to take shape down there.
Burnt Umber Neutral Tint. Get a little bit of darker reflections now on that far side. Where, as I've said, it's there's not too much light coming in there. So the main light is where, I guess, in, in the, just to the left of centre, where the bright green is, that's where it's lightest. Right, bit of white gouache. Let's go thicky, pasty with our application. Bit of the lemon yellow gouache as well. Flat brush, not too much water. Just applying a little bit more light to some of the rocks. Just where there, there could be a bit of light catching them. Just again, I'm, I'm looking at the source photo, but trying to, in my own mind, trying to think of the form of these rocks and the light hitting, the light coming in through the middle of the sinkhole, the cenotic, and just where that light might be. Now this white gouache, it, it's not bright white and particularly there where the cave was i went in quite thick with the darker the darker paint so it's just a little bit probably just a little bit mixing and getting a more of a, a grayish opaqueish covering which i think uh, works really well to get that sort of rock that texture of rock texture of limestone over there on that on that just that left of center that brighter area Go a bit softer in the middle here. Don't want that to be, we'll, we'll feel the edges a bit too hard. I'll just try and soften it up, particularly um, on the edges, on the boundary, on the border, the boundary of the painting. And in that uh, little area there, where we've got the two, two uh, palm trees coming up, the main, the main palm tree, and then the little one, little one, a little bit further back. Now dry things up a little bit because the next layer has got to be hard edges. To, to some extent, the, the next step, which will be the starting with the vertical tree roots is going to be the icing on top of the cake. It really will provide some some context to the it looks all that background looks fairly boring at the moment and I think once I get the tree roots in that just adds another dimension to it all right so smaller brush smaller synthetic brush and again the white gouache trying to get the right consistency here so it's a this is a fairly small rounded synthetic brush This one, this brush, I think it's from Rosemary and Co. Not sure, not sure exactly what which one it is, but it's got a good point to it. Could, I could use a rigger for this, um, either or really. And now, so these tree roots, I can't have them too evenly spaced. I've got to think random. And one of the important things with using white gouache like this is the water to the water to paint ratio picked up a bit of dark color there just for a few darker leaves coming in from the top I'm trying to give that feeling of a covering where where i am was a little bit well the the steps entering the cenote were on my on my left hand side sort of curving around my left shoulder and then where i was is almost tucked into the far the opposite side to where the cave is a little bit of a covering and then 
all these palm leaves like a canopy over the top of you protecting you so a little bit of that and then these vertical these vertical roots I suppose to some extent they're, they're actually protecting the limestone in a way they're almost supporting it and stopping it from crumbling even more and they must they must be coming from the trees that are growing just along the the sort of lip of the the edge of the cenote and they've just learnt they've <laughs> they've just adapted to their leaves going through the rock holding the rock going around the going around the different layers and then going eventually going down to the uh the water the water surface i suppose the water surface it does change in level through the year where you get the the rainy season or the dry season probably where where the water was where when i was there would be probably more the usual level right continue on over the right hand side and some of well, these roots they're obviously different thicknesses they go a little bit thinner they've got over on the right hand side just a little bit darker as well and also with the with the actual marks i'm making i want to try and create that sort of cascading feel as it hits as it hits a horizontal layer then it it sort of rests there and then it and it travels on travels on and then just goes um drops down to the surface of the water bouncing across different obstacles it finds along the way uh, right down that right hand side let's have a more a more sort of warmish um, feeling to a root down there let's angle it slightly in towards the scene rather than away you can see my my brush now not much not much paint on the brush let's just replenish it a little bit and back to this middle area try and make that try and make that right hand third that that those roots down that right hand third i'll try and make them a bit more dominant and a, a few more of these roots coming down so i've got to do got to do these roots first then i'll do just a few reflections of those and the gentle sort of movement in the water probably created by those divers swimmers but it probably is a bit of movement anyway with the dripping of the water here we are let's start some of these reflections as the boulder mix in a little bit of red with it so we've got a, a darker because they because those vertical roots are quite bright and white let's make them a little bit darker and just a few little squiggly lines there do you see it doesn't matter if it's too perfect a little bit more erratic as I come further away from the far pool. A few reflections there and there of the center one. They're going to stand out a bit more where there's a, a darker background. The, the darker water there. Not do too many because otherwise you can see from the source photo you can just about see a sort of softer reflection of some of those tree roots and it's going to it's going to constantly change when there's a little bit of removing the water the reflection is going to change so much um, you just got to capture a moment in time really a little squiggly one there which you some of those tree roots they were almost like a sort of spiral like a spring in a way like a coil coming down that 
think it's gradually taking shape. I, I think those reflections on the water, they are just beginning to create the feeling of a sort of glassy surface to the to the water as well. All right, just emphasize those a little bit more. Um, going to show up quite a lot against the darker background, the darker uh, parts of the of the uh, limestone where the shadow is, where the shade is. Perhaps a few lying across the the top of that rock. A few more down here. Over to the left. Hits that level platform, maybe goes along a little bit, then disappears behind the, the palm tree. Now, while I'm uh, working with this white uh, gouache, I now want to get in the brighter palm leaves that are hitting the light. There is that central palm frond, palm leaf, that I think will look quite nice against that darker background. So had to do the had to do the roots first. That, that was easiest for me to do those background roots first. Now I come forwards with this opaque colour and just a few highlights where these palm leaves are catching the light. And again thinking about their shape, the like the uh, a palm frond, it's uh, the, like the hand of your the fingers coming out from your hand and just, just flicking out those little individual leaf shapes. Just a few. And then, so some bright green, and then I want to get in some warmer orange. So the lemon, yellow gouache, cadmium orange, thick, pasty, opaqueish paint. And these would be the sort of dead, dead, deader leaves of the palm tree that are hanging down just before they sort of drop off and add to the debris on the floor. But just a few of those giving, giving another warm really against the, the cool and another bit of lighter area uh, against the, the darker background, a few soft edges as well. A few little dry brush marks. Uh, put in a few of the leaves also, just here and there, random, where they're dropping from a tree. I guess they, the palm tree there, it had more of a another sort of evergreen tree or deciduous tree right next to it, and all these these leaves have dropped down. And then I need to get the, the figure in, but I can just about still see the pencil outline of the figure, which hopefully will stand out quite well against the, the lighter background where that light boulder is. That's where the figure's head and shoulders will be. So I'll start off uh, at the top of the figure. A, a similar brush to, to what I used before for the roots, a small round synthetic brush. This is an Escoda Perla. Not sure what size it is. Had it a good had it a good few years. But the nice thing about this brush is you can well the point is long since gone, but it creates nice like a nice little flat edge. It's quite it's quite good for doing intricate work like this, trying to get that figure just right. The feeling of the figure not too dark. Don't want to make the figure too dark, it would stand out a bit more. But I, I suppose there's a similar value to the cave behind and connect with the boulder. The arms on the tops of the legs or the knees and then just a little bit of the leg disappearing behind that rock. Use my fingertip just to merge things along, keep things going. Uh, while I've got this brush, add a bit more definition to 
the branch there, the, the roots. A few darker, darker areas, a bit more definition to that boulder. Perhaps some of these tree roots, they have a little bit of shade or a shadow on the right hand side, water's edge. Then I need some reflections for the darker area of the, of that far side there. Uh, let's pick a bit of cobalt blue. And no, normally I would use a mop brush for this, but as it's a fairly small area of affection, I'll, I'll, I'll keep going with this brush, but a mop brush would be ideal. A smaller mop brush, probably than the Tintoretto I was using, just to get that right sort of brush head shape to get those reflection marks. Essentially, these are horizontal lines just here and there, to, just uh, creating the sense of that movement, cutting across some of those verticals of the reflections of the tree roots. Not too many. Bit of cobalt green, cobalt blue, cerulean blue, and a, a darker blue here for some darker reflections on this right hand side. Connect with the, the darker, the little sort of uh, the underneath of that boulder where it's very dark. Hardly any water on the brush now. Just dry, dry brush marks. Holding the brush like a pen or pencil. A bit more of the spring green on the right hand side where there's just a few leaves I can see just growing out of a, a some sort of tree on that far side. Just a few little blobs of green paint there. And a bit of variety to that background. A few more on the ground as well. Green leaves that have dropped down. Bit of light on the top of that border. Again, some lighter, lighter greens against the darker green of the, the actual palm tree trunk. Another little frond on that side. Palm tree like this, sometimes the messier you make it, the more the more realistic it can look. Not um, If you're doing this yourself, don't go too perfect with the palm tree. Now for some lavender, a favorite color of mine and particularly useful in darker areas of the painting, getting in. I like it uh, on stonework in the shade. I think it's very effective there. And just softening up some edges, using it for emphasizing maybe 
the rays of the sun coming through the canopy of a, a forest or, a, or trees. That's very effective there. So just a few little dry brush marks here, just to lighten up that area. So many different colours in the foreground. When you look at the photo, greens, browns, reds, blues, whites as well. Darker, darker brown for some of those tree roots, just to add a bit more definition to some of those, particularly where the roots go across a lighter area. Then coming down from the top as well, that. Uh, said earlier, the, the feeling of the enclosure of the space. Not too many. I want to try and, and uh, hopefully we, I've still got the feeling of the light coming to, from that top left corner. Cross over some of the those verticals. Some of these brush marks you you can hardly see, but they just give a little bit of definition, some extra textures to the surface. So I now need to Do a little bit more of the palm fronds coming from that top left corner. But I need to use the white paint again just to add in a a few little dabs of brighter leaves on the on the uh, foreground in the bottom left corner on the foreground. The obligatory highlighting on top of the, the head that just makes that that head just pop a little bit, tiny bit on the top of the boulder there. Again, thinking where the light's coming from, that uh, sort of level, the sort of level top of the boulder, and more sh more more highlighting on the left hand side of some of these objects. That tree trunk goes under the boulder, a few more little bits of highlighting on that top left background, maybe just a tiny bit of highlighting on some of the rocks on that far side. Just a little bit. Again, smooth it out with my finger just where might have gone a bit too bright, so I want to get a soft, a soft edge to it. Emphasize some of that reflection a bit more. So using gouache and a pe opaque paint like this, the paint's going to dry darker, whereas watercolor will dry lighter. Gouache, yeah, they're all, they're different. Gouache dries darker. So I might need to just uh, go in and brighten things up a little bit. Cut across those reflections that I put in earlier. Crisscross some of those 
perfections as well. And a few little leaves or litter catching the light. Boulder there, little, little light boulder there on the water's edge. Bit of light on the top of that, soft light. Bits and pieces on the tops of the boulders there. Careful not to overdo it. I want the, the main focal point to be, well, I guess that figure, or well, maybe some of the roots on the far side, but I want to put, go through a dangerous phase here. And the trick, of course, is knowing, is knowing when to stop, which is, about now, there's not a lot more I can do. I can do with this. So as I normally do, a little bit of a self-critique towards the end. Subject then, the I think it's called the Bhutan Cenote in Yucatan, one of many thousands of these sinkholes and trying to get the feeling of the light coming into this space, this unique space with the limestone cliff tops in the, in the distance there, the light coming in from the top left. There's the, there's the kind of top layer of the sinkhole, the um, cenote. And then beyond that, you've got this very arid, very different landscape, brown, but down here it's all green and of so many, so many colors going on, uh, it's, it's magical. So the composition wise, uh, I, th I think I've got a fairly good composition with a figure, the connecting with, using that figure, this is another thing, connecting that, using that figure to connect the foreground with the background. And also trees, I guess, on the left-hand side, they're doing that also. These tree roots, they're, they're also connecting those different bands of light, dark, light, dark, light, bit of dark, light, dark. Do you see what I mean? You've got those bands happening there, but we're we're traversing those, we're connecting those with those with those tree roots. Um, tree roots in well, you could have used masking fluid, I guess. I I have never got on with masking fluid. I will either leave an area unpainted like I did with the boulders, but very small intricate areas like those vertical tree roots and the the palm leaves. For me, it's easier to go in with the, the darker, opaque, thickish paint up towards as a sort of later stage. Background, they're fairly happy with the background. Got the feeling of the, 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 the depth and the, the texture of the rock and the light hitting the rocks, the water as well. That area of lily pads on that far side. It, if I'd have drawn those little sort of lily pad shapes, that would have, it'd have been too much detail for the background. I want to just keep that light and green. A nice sort of yellowy green then and transitioning into more of the cobalt green and then getting a bit darker. The soft sort of the dark bedrock just beginning to show through there on that right hand side. Uh, left hand side, framing on the left hand side of those palm trees and the different the sort of abstract shape of these these leaves crossing each other and little little shapes of triangles squares, rectangles appearing there of the, the light coming through that canopy. Bottom left corner, not too much detail. Actually, I could have gone, I could have gone in with a little bit of darkness around the, some of the, um, some of those little leaf shapes. I could have gone a, bit, a little bit, uh, could have taken some dark paint and gone in if you see what I mean, gone in with a little bit of shadow 
just below those to give them a bit more form and, and definition. But on the whole, fairly happy with that. Placement of the figure and yeah, and, and the reflections are finally the reflections of those vertical tree roots. So Cenote in Mexico, have a go yourself. Um, if you're on Patreon, uh, pop it on the gallery, the members gallery. Love to uh, see your efforts there. Thanks for watching. Catch up with you on the next one for a completely different scene as usual. Bye-bye.